Speaker Johnson. How they're playing this. Yeah, I say to Speaker Johnson, don't let the 30 hard right uh, people in the House who are extreme. They wanted us to default. They wanted the government not to pay its debts. They wanted us, um, to, the government to shut down. They're extremists. And they're running your show. Do the right thing. I can't wait to talk to one of these extremists. Joining me now, great congressman of the state of Texas, my friend Chip Roy. Chip, I can only assume you're one of these extremists Chuck Schumer is talking about. Why are you being so extreme about this whole thing? I don't know, man. Just, you know, just breaking out all my extreme uh, desires to have a secure border and to have a sovereign nation. You know, it's just crazy talk. It's nuts, you know. And uh, meanwhile, you know, they're not extreme at all, you know, wanting wide open borders and 10,000 people a day from all over the world with uh, schools that don't teach that America's good or that, uh, you know, God exists and that they want to undermine our entire way of life. They're not extreme at all. They're not they're not effectively colonizers. Right. Uh, Democrats trying to impress their values on people all around the world, by the way, including people in Africa. But maybe that's a conversation for another day. Chip, before we get into the specifics about all the money for them and little for us, and just on a, on a general topic, I don't think I've had this many emails in a week in my entire life of people upset, understandably so, that we have to cobble completely separate subjects into one bill all the time and that this isn't even controversial anymore. A, a United States Senator, no, I'll only pretend to secure your border if you also write me a big fat check I can hand this country and that country. It's so nakedly corrupt and broken and it's just the way it's done now. They don't even consider it scandalous. Well, it's just the way things are done here and, and it's ridiculous. You know, last year when we set out to change the town, when we had the debate over the speaker, you know, we were actually successful for a while. People have forgotten that because we didn't deliver the goods in the end. But we got HR2 passed, which is the best border bill we've ever gotten done, because frankly, we, we fo focused on just a one subject bill dealing with the border, not, not amnesty, not future immigration, just literally border security. We passed a good defense bill that got abandoned in December by the Uniparty, but we passed a good bill. We passed seven appropriations bills off the floor. We passed 10 bills out of committee onto the floor. Uh, on, on, uh, we've got 1,100 amendments, meaning we were fixing the place. But the Uniparty does what it does best. It starts rallying around to figure out what they can do to make the Chamber of Commerce and big corporate America and the big defense establishment happy. And that's what's going on right now. But the American people have a voice in this. And some of us are trying to be the voice for them. And uh, let, let's also remember, Democrats here, they're using this as cover. And Republicans shouldn't take the bait and sort of chase this shiny object too much. I don't mind crapping on the bill. Let's kill it in the cradle before it moves out of the Senate, before it gets to the House. But let's pivot back to the truth. Democrats want to destroy their country with open borders. They're doing it intentionally. They want this bill as cover so they can go undermine President Trump and Republicans in the fall by saying it's us who are not working to secure the border. We shouldn't take the bait. We passed a good bill. We should stand behind it. And we should actually fight for it uh, during the appropriations process here in March. Can you handicap this thing for me? It, I keep hearing it's dead in the House, it's dead in the House. There's been some real hot garbage passing the House in the past few months. Is it really dead in the House? Yeah, on this one, I believe it is dead. I think the Speaker and I think everybody okay. knows that this thing has no chance. I mean, you already had Steve Scalise saying it's not going to get floor time. He controls what gets to the floor. Uh, Speaker Johnson has said it's DOA. Uh, Elise Stefanik has said it's dead. Uh, you know, Mark Green, the chairman of Homeland Security, Jim Jordan, the chairman of Judiciary, uh, all of us are out there recognizing how bad the bill is. And importantly, I think they're now up to 20 Senate Republicans, I think. I'm not fully up to speed on the count. Around 20 who have already said there are no. So the no's are mounting. And uh, even though you are correct, we've passed a hot mess of garbage over the last three or four months with continuing resolutions and Nancy Pelosi's bills and the national defense with FISA spending and a tax bill written on K Street. Uh, we, we do think on this one, we can jam this one up, up uh, including the Ukraine funding. But guess what? They will come back, right? They will try to jam us on Ukraine funding. They'll try to make people feel guilty about that or, for example, Israel funding. Uh, and so we need to go on offense. And if I had it, to, if it were my pick, I would send it over. I'd send over a full year appropriations bill that would trigger the caps that were embraced last year that both you and I thought were not nearly good enough. But that a majority of Republicans and Democrats Democrats voted for. It would reduce spending by about, I don't know, $40 billion off of last year's Nancy Pelosi levels. 
it would cut non defense about seventy billion, which would be good. And I would just tack HR two to it. I'd play the swamp games that's relating the game, and I'd fire that over the Senate, and I would tell Schumer to choke on it, and I'll see him in November. But I don't know if we've got a, enough Republicans who are willing to play that kind of hardball. Chip, can you explain? I'm glad you brought up the defense industry earlier, and I, I don't know whether this is it. I don't know whether this is the answer. I'm asking the question. The obsession with Ukraine, and again, I don't fault people for rooting for Ukraine. Russia invaded. Again, all that's fine, but from what I understand on the ground, the deal was kind of done. Russia has bitten. They've holded. They're not going to be pushed out, and yet our politicians still obsess over this place for what reason? Well, look, this is one of the things that happens in this town, right? Everybody says, well, we got to go down this road, and then the machine gets to working, and they say, well, now we got to spend that money. And, oh, ship, we've already spent that money. Now we have to replenish our stockpiles. This really isn't about sending any more money for those corrupt oligarchs and for to fund their pensions. This is really about our stockpiles. Meanwhile, then you get a report later in two years that says, no, that's horse crap. And, in fact, we were still funding them. In other words, the point is, everybody in this town, Republican. In the DNA, going back, I think, to, you know, fighting the commies, you know, under Reagan and, and the Cold War, Republicans basically are, well, we got to go do the war stuff and the military stuff. And so the war machine is what we got to focus on. And you know what? Yeah, corporate tax rates, we got to do that, right? Economic growth, corporate tax cuts. Now, you and I both are fine supporting and making sure we stop bad guys if, when you need to at our national security interest. You and I both want economic growth and low taxes. But... When is it that it's good for us to be shills for corporate America and the big defense industrial complex and never really stand up for the hardworking American who's getting hosed? Never really stand up to secure the border and you know, the people that are getting hurt. Never actually stand up for the people who send us here and say, stand up to Washington and the swamp instead of doing whatever the K Street people are bidding. And again, it's not that people are getting bought by like K Street donors and stuff. That's probably part of it for some people. But at the end of the day, what it is, is that's the way the town works. They write the bills. They say, here's what you got to do. And then all the messengers go out and say, oh, but the people of Ukraine. And then they bring Zelensky over. He shows up. He gives a speech right before the spending deal. And everybody goes, oh, my God, I've got a blue and yellow pen. I got to do it. I got to go spend the money. Fact is, the American people are sick of this. I can promise you that's where they are mentally. Because, frankly, I took a position this weekend where I said, I love Israel. I do. God bless Israel. As a Christian, as somebody who's been over there a lot, but I don't think we should write a blank check in a clean Israel bill of $17 billion when our borders are wide open and we're bleeding money and we have no money and we're deficit spending $2 trillion. I tweeted that out. Mm. I got overwhelming support, including from Jewish uh, constituents. Yeah. No, I'm with, I'm with you. It's, it's insane. It's just blank checks for everybody. Okay, before I let you go real quick, Congressman. The Texas border, that became a real hot story for about 15 minutes. Razor wire and the Supreme Court and the federal government. And I've always been a bit of a cynical soul, as you know, Chip. But I figured this kind of this whole thing would go away without anybody getting their hands dirty. Why is it not in the news anymore? This thing work out? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to watch, right? We had numbers that were three to 4,000 that were coming across in Eagle Pass. Now those numbers are about two to 300. There are multiple reasons why, one of which is the razor wire and the fact that, you know, the governor has put up all those uh, shipping containers and, and, and blocked off that area where, where people were coming across there in Eagle Pass. The other reason is because uh, Biden has had to, uh, conversations with Oberdor to reduce the overall numbers because they politically know they need to get the numbers down. So that's the dirty little secret that Todd Benzman's written about. But the bottom line is the numbers are down a little bit. They're not going to go to Eagle Pass because the cartels are smart. They're like, oh, crap, Texas is all fired up about this right now. Let's go to Arizona and California. So now the, the numbers are all flowing through over there. I got an update from Bill Malugin. I think the numbers were like six or 7,000 yesterday, almost all going up through more through Arizona and California. The cartels, it's a business. They, they're going to just move wherever the, the least resistance is. The question really here is, will Texas hold the line for the long haul? And will they go further? Will we remove people? Will we put up more barriers? Will we hold the line up and down the entire 1,200-mile border and not just the park in Eagle Pass? That's, I think, the question left on the table for Texas. 